There's something about ancient Greco sculpture that has continued to fascinate humans throughout the ages. To start, both ancient Roman and the Holy Roman Empire, the Renaissance, the Grand Tour, the Victorians, the modern age of technological excellence, and all the Fast and Furious movies. These sculptures are viewed as the earliest sigils of Western society, intellectualism, and history. These sculptures depict how the West was born and despite enduring some hardships, some of these sculptures are still standing in museums attracting millions of viewers. But who were the men responsible for these magnificent figures? Who were these artistic geniuses set in the high standards for Western art? What was the reason for their obsession with bareness and what dark secrets did they hide in their closets? Welcome to Nutty History. Today we are unraveling the filthy secrets of ancient Greek sculpture artists. Sculpture of a Woman Greek art, like vase paintings, drinking cups, frescoes, mosaics, and especially sculptures, love to portray the bareness. But they were also heavily biased towards male naturism. A slender-toned, ageless male image with six-pack abs and a baby face with a neutral expression was considered the pinnacle of the natural art form. But why such an obsession with male naturism? A simple answer to that is the Greeks believed naturism was powerful, ideal, and beautiful. If you are interested to learn how Greek art has shaped, defined, and changed the course of art over the years, we cannot recommend anything better than the Noonan Art documentary series on Magellan TV. The descriptive details from ancient Greece to Baroque art are a compelling journey about skin and art and how it changed society. Magellan TV not only has great documentaries on the history of art, but also war, money, fashion, and politics. Their extensive collection of documentaries also includes space and science about how we are furthering our reach into the future. If you ever wanted a Netflix for documentaries, you have Magellan TV. You can try this fantastic service for a whole month. Start your free one-month trial today, which can be accessed at try.magellantv.com slash nuttyhistory. Check out the finest history documentaries available on Magellan right now. However, in reality, things were a bit complicated. The ancient Greeks were basically selling a social agenda or normative culture by using naturism. According to Kenneth Lapotin, curator of antiquities at the Getty Villa Museum, Greeks believed that their idea of idealized naturism was their way to tell the ancient world that they were a mighty civilization. Male bareness continued to dominate ancient Greek art until the 4th century BC. But then an artist named Praxiteles broke the mold and carved the statue that became both literally and metaphorically the most desired statue of its time, and it was of a woman in all her natureness. Well, technically it was a goddess, or a woman posed as the goddess, the Aphrodite of Nidos. It was a highly controversial art piece of its time, and sadly, though it did not survive to the present times, we are fortunate to have several copies around the world to at least know what it looked like. The craze for the statue was such that Lucian told a story of a nobleman who was so obsessed with it that he would spend the night in the temple precincts only so he could be near it. When the poor guy was caught and chastised for lusting for a statue, he threw himself into the sea to end his life out of embarrassment. But what inspired Praxiteles to create such a controversial and risky sculpture? The answer lies in the secrets of his private life. During the time Praxiteles was struck with the inspiration to carve Aphrodite of Nidos, he also was seeing a hetera named Phryne. Now, this was a tad blasphemous on Praxiteles' part, as a hetera means a courtesan. Born in Thespiae in Boeotia, Phryne moved to Athens to make a living. If the statue was indeed based on her, then Phryne had to be an absolute charmer of a woman. A straight nose, round jaw, dainty pout, and a lovely set of wide eyes. Ironically, the word Phryne in ancient Greek meant toad. But beauty wasn't the only thing Phryne was known for. She had the brains to match it. Smart, witty, independent, and inquisitive. Phryne's name is often taken in the same breath as the 4th century BC philosophers of Athens. If some accounts are to be believed, Phryne was her trade name, and her real name before arriving at Athens was Mesarete, which has a much better meaning than an ugly amphibian, remembering virtue. But then again, that was quite an overqualified name for someone in the business of being a courtesan. Athenius, a writer from the 3rd century BC, once met Phryne at a social event celebrating philosophers and asked her if she really was the muse for the Aphrodite of Praxiteles. She wittingly responded, that's nothing. You are the arrows of Phetius. 
Thaddeus was another celebrated sculptor, but his name is close to the Greek word phido, which means thrift. Friday's response is supposed to be a pun, but you know puns are not easy to translate. Nonetheless, the answer did impress Athenius, and he also used her antidote as a muse in his collection of tales, the Deipnosophist. According to noted historian Pliny the Elder, there was more to the Praxiteles' sculpture than the controversy in the yearning. There wasn't just one Aphrodite sculpture, but two. Praxiteles created one statue clothed and one in its natureness. He offered the statue to the people of Kos who scrunched their noses at the naturism one and bought the drape one for its modesty. The Nidians, however, were glad to buy the bearskin version, and it proved to be a sound investment. Not only did Aphrodite of Nidos become a tourist attraction, but it was also considered superior by peer artists. Nidos was so fond of their controversial treasure that they refused King Norcomedes' offer to buy the statue in return for paying off Nidos' public debt. Seemingly, everyone wanted to see Aphrodite in all her natureness. Statue Filiac While Praxiteles turned his lover into an immortal statue, Pygmalion turned his statue into his lover. Pygmalion was the king of Cyprus and a legendary sculptor who could be considered the stark contrasting personality of Praxiteles. Pygmalion actually got his rocks off on an actual piece of stone that he carved into the image of a woman, mentioned in Ovid's tenth book of Metamorphoses. Praxiteles' muse was a courtesan, but Pygmalion abhorred the idea of women practicing the oldest trade in human history. Ovid wrote that when Pygmalion saw the propetides of Cyprus practicing the trade of the flesh, he began detesting the faults beyond measure which nature has given to women. Ovid's words, not ours. Pygmalion then decided to remain celibate and devoted his life to sculpting. Ovid described that Pygmalion became extremely skillful with his sculpting and crafted a sculpture of a woman named Galatea so perfect that he fell in love with it. He wasn't shy about publicly displaying affection for the statue, bringing it gifts, and creating a sumptuous bed for it. Sounds kind of unreal, doesn't it? Well, because probably it is a fictional tale, as there is no record of a real King Pygmalion. Moreover, Ovid's tale of Pygmalion further becomes surreal, as he mentions that with Aphrodite's boon, Pygmalion was successful to turn the statue into a real person and marry her. But is this a chance that perhaps there were Greek art fanatics who fell in love with statues? Very likely. It happens in modern times, too. Remember that Japanese guy who married a doll? And he wasn't the only one. Phidias and Athena's Money There cannot be a discussion about ancient Greek sculpture artists without mentioning Phidias. 2,500 years after his death, the maestro was still alive through his creations that shaped ancient Greece through the classical age as we know it today. His work includes the Acropolis of Athens, one of the former seven wonders of the world, the statue of Zeus in Olympia, and of course, the statue of Athena. Born somewhere around 490, unfortunately, most of his life account has been lost to time, but we know that the son of Carmides studied Greek sculpture next to Hegias and Hagelatus. He rose to prominence quite rapidly after becoming friends with prominent Athens politician Percoles. Together, the two visionaries worked on rebranding Athens, which led to the Golden Age of Athens. Pericles put Phidias in charge of transforming the hill of Acropolis into a monument to Athenian democracy. Phidias soon proved that there couldn't have been anyone better than him to do the job, so for the next decade, Phidias devoted himself to the monument. But in 430s BC, fingers were pointed at him and his intentions. Under Pericles' rule, Phidias was responsible for the construction of the Parthenon frieze and the bronze sculptures of Athena Promachos, the Limnian Athena, and the golden ivory image of Athena Parthenos inside the Parthenon. While Phidias didn't care for what was happening outside the Parthenon, Pericles knew people were getting envious of Phidias' work. Moreover, Pericles was getting credit for employing Phidias, and that wasn't sitting well with Pericles' political rivals. Pericles warned Phidias to be extremely careful with the funds provided for the work during the construction of the last statue, as political and artistic rivals of the two friends were looking for a reason to malign their image. Phidias continued to work without paying much attention to the gossip, and right around when he finished the job, Pericles' rivals accused Phidias of embezzlement. Phidias wasn't distracted by their accusation, but he was careful during his work. He made sure that all the statue's golden parts were detachable, and when they were weighed, the math checked out, and Phidias was cleared of all charges. Happy ending? Well, that's just one version of the story. There is another version of the story where, despite proving his innocence, Phidias wasn't acquitted and things got worse later. Phidias wasn't even out of the waters of embezzlement when a new controversy about his work piled up. 
Pericles' rivals blame Phidias for intentionally depicting himself and Pericles on the shield of Athena. This sort of hubris was considered the highest form of blasphemy in ancient Greece's religion. In addition, Phidias was also accused socially of soliciting women for Pericles. The story diverges into many branches from here. Some historians believe that Phidias was found guilty of the charges and died in prison in Athens. Others believe that he was banished to Olympia and penalized to complete the statue of Zeus, which took a huge toll on him. It caused his death not long after finishing the project. Others think that none of this happened, and Phidias was awarded the statue of Zeus project for his great work in Athens. Now, we may never know for certain if Phidias, the great sculpture artist, was a thief and a man of hubris or not. It is amazing how these artists existed thousands of years ago and immortalized themselves through their work. But are we sure about them? There are questions regarding the credits. Did Callicrates design the Athena Nike? Can the works of Mirian, Scopus, and Lysippus be truly authenticated to them? Did Polycletus solely design the canon that became the standard proportions for sculpting? We may never know, but we do know that Greek art would continue to inspire many artists for hundreds of years, if not more, no matter how dark and filthy the secrets are behind them. Thanks for watching Nutty History. If you enjoyed the video, smash the like button, share the video, and subscribe.